We're going to be in the book of Zephaniah this morning. We're continuing our series, The B-Side, Major Messages from Lesser Known Voices. We're working through the minor prophets in the Old Testament who are lesser known but have powerful, powerful messages. And this morning, we're on the book of Zephaniah. Just a short three-chapter book again. We're going to start in Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 1. We read the word of the Lord that came to Zephaniah, son of Cushai, son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, during the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. Zephaniah's name, we're pretty sure it means the Lord protects, or it could mean the Lord hides. It could even mean the Lord treasures. Keep that one in mind for later. We might come back to that later on. But Zephaniah prophesied to the southern kingdom of Judah. If you've been following along in this series, remember the kingdom of Israel is divided. The northern kingdom was in the north. The southern kingdom was in the south. At the time when Zephaniah is prophesying, the northern kingdom has already gone into captivity. Assyria is kind of taking it out. And Zephaniah is prophesying during the reign of Josiah, who was a good king. According to 2 Chronicles 34.2, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and he followed the ways of his father David, not turning aside to the right or to the left. So what I want to do this morning, i give a really, really quick overview of the book of Zephaniah, three-chapter book. We'll kind of look at it from 30,000 feet, and then we're going to descend into some of the details and get to the major message from this minor prophet that God has for us today. So just an overview. Zephaniah chapter 1. Zephaniah warns of this widespread judgment, this punishment that's coming. Much like Habakkuk warned last week, coming to Judah and all those who live in Jerusalem because of their idolatry and their refusal to stay faithful to God. And he talks a lot about the day of the Lord. I mean, more than any of the other minor prophets, the day of the Lord is a huge theme. And we got into that a little bit when we studied the book of Joel. So I'm not going to get into it this morning too much. You can go back and listen to that one if you need to. But I want to just say this. The day of the Lord is kind of like this two-sided record, just like a vinyl record has two sides to it. On one side, Zephaniah describes this day as a day that's near, a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish and trouble and ruin and darkness, and you get the point, clouds, for all who refuse to walk in relationship with God, for all who turn their back on God. But on the other side of this record, the other side of this day of the Lord, chapter 3 in Zephaniah describes it as a day of great hope for the, and, and future restoration for the faithful remnant of God's people. Now, in light of this coming judgment that Zephaniah talks about in chapter 1, chapter 2 begins with an invitation to repent, a call to turn from their ways and their wickedness back to God. And it's likely, we're not 100% sure, but it's likely that Zephaniah's message inspired King Josiah to be the good king that he was and to put into place a number of reforms. We're going to look at those in a few minutes. But the rest of chapter 2 describes the coming judgment and devastation on Judah's neighbors. There's all these different passages in there about Philistia, Cush, Assyria, Moab, Ammon, all of, the, all of the, those. There's going to be judgment coming to them as well. And when we get to chapter 3, we see that if Judah did respond to that invitation to repent, it, it, it was obviously short-lived. Something has gone wrong because chapter 3 has strong words, for, especially for the city of Jerusalem which was the capital of Judah. Zephaniah calls it the, the city of oppressors, rebellious and defiled. She obeys no one. She accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to God. And then he goes on to describe her officials as roaring lions. He calls her rulers evening wolves. He calls her, their prophets unprincipled and their priests profane. So not a pretty picture. And in verse 7, God says... Of Jerusalem, he says, of Jerusalem, I thought, surely you will fear me and accept correction. Then her place of refuge would not be destroyed, nor all my punishments come upon her. But they were still eager to act corruptly in all they did. And then in chapter 3, goes on to talk about this great hope for the faithful remnant. But before we get there, I want to talk about what went wrong. Something has obviously gone terribly wrong before, be, be, between the reforms that King Josiah instituted and the description of Jerusalem that we just looked at. So I've titled today's message, The Heart 
of the matter. The heart of the matter. I want us to try to get to the bottom, to the heart of the matter with regards to what happened to God's people. In Jeremiah chapter 2, Jeremiah was a contemporary of Zephaniah. He writes, uh, verse 1 and 2, we read, The word of the Lord came to me, go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says. God says, I remember the devotion of your youth. How as a bride you loved me, how you followed me through the wilderness, through a land not sown. And so the question that I was wrestling with is, how did God's people in Jerusalem go from a people who were devoted to a people who were defiled? How did they go from loving God the way a bride loves her husband to a people who don't even any longer draw near to God? How did they go from being a people committed to following God to a people bent on rebelling and refusing any kind of correction? And the reason I want to ask this question is because if we can get to the heart of the matter, we can learn from the mistakes that they made without making them ourselves so we don't go down the same path they went down. So we're going to start in Zephaniah chapter 1. You could turn there in your Bibles if you have one. And we're going to see that there were some warning signs. There were some indicators that something was wrong beneath the surface. The first of which was these people had been distracted by counterfeit gods. They were distracted by counterfeit gods. A counterfeit god is someone or something that we are looking to to provide for us what only God can provide. So when I look to someone or when I look to something to find my identity in life or to find my significance or to find my security or to find my satisfaction, I am making that someone or something into a counterfeit God. I'm allowing it to take the place of God. I'm going outside of God to find what only God can provide. So in Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 4, we read, The Lord says, I will destroy every remnant of Baal worship in this place, the very names of the idolatrous priests, those who bow down on the roofs to worship the starry host." And those who bow down and swear by the Lord and who also swear by Moloch. Now, if we want to get into the heart of the matter, I think we need to dig into what some of these counterfeit gods were in Zephaniah's day so that we could understand how they relate to us today. Because our temptation might be to read this and go, I don't know who Baal is, I don't know who Moloch is, I have no idea what he's talking about, starry host, this doesn't apply to me. But it does. Because the gods are just different. I mean, there's, 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 we all have counterfeit gods. We all have idols that we, we, we allow to in, influence our lives. And so if we want to sort of get into the heart of it, we need to dig into these counterfeit gods say, what did they stand for in Zephaniah's day? And how can they relate to us today? So the first one that he mentions there is Baal. Baal, throughout the Old Testament, there were many Baals. But Baal, the main Baal, was the Canaanite god of prosperity and fertility. Prosperity and fertility. The Canaanites believed that the gods or the spirits controlled the fertility of the people, the fertility of the the land, the fertility of the animals. And the more fertile the people, the more fertile the land, the more fertile their animals, the more prosperous they would be. And so they would try to incite Baal. They would worship Baal through these ritualized sexual acts. Leviticus warns against it to try to, to, in the name of becoming prosperous, in the name of being successful. Now, there's nothing innately wrong with wealth or prosperity. Okay, I want to say that. There's nothing innately wrong with wealth or prosperity. In fact, a lot of people in our day misquote the Bible and they say things like money is the root of all evil. How many know the Bible doesn't say that? Doesn't say that. You know, anyone know what the Bible does say? The love of money. Yeah. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, for the love of money. So when money becomes a counterfeit God, when it gets, becomes the, des- the, the desire of our affection, it becomes, 2 Timothy 6.10 says, the love of money is a root of all evil, of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So in other words, when money becomes the object of our affection, when it be- gets a disproportionate amount of our attention, it can become a God. It can become an idol. And when that happens, it becomes a root that throws us off track. But that's not the only root. It's a root. When we look at money to give us what only God can give us, or when we think that without it, 
that we're somehow less as a person? We've crossed that line, and it's become a god. It's become an idol to us. We're going to it for something that only God can give. Baal can also be, in our day, it could be the drive for success. And again, there's nothing innately wrong with wanting to be successful. But when that drive for success gets our priorities out of whack, or when we start measuring our value as a human being based on our success, then success becomes our Baal. It becomes our God. The next counterfeit God mentioned in this is the starry host. Those who bow down on the roofs to worship the starry host. He's talking about the stars. When you look up at the stars and you see them. Deuteronomy 4.19 says, When you look up to the sky and see the sun, the moon, and the stars, all the heavenly array. It's beautiful. It's breathtaking. Do not be enticed into bowing down to them and worshiping things the Lord your God has a portion to all the nations under heaven. Now you go, I don't worship stars. Okay. Let me give you a quote from a guy named James Bruckner in his commentary on Zephaniah. He writes this. The starry host of our time is whatever is considered awesome. Whatever is considered awesome. In the present culture, consider the everyday exaltation of vacation experiences, image-making cars, status, clothing, or the latest technology. The worship status of these wonder-filled things can be measured by how much money is sacrificed to them. Now, is he saying don't go on vacation? No. Is he saying don't drive a car? No. He's talking about crossing that line when that's the motivation, when that's Drawing chairs. I think, man, when I think of the, the starry skies, we lived in Alberta for, Alberta, Canada for about almost four years. If you've never been in Alberta, it's just north of Montana. You know one of the nicknames for Montana is Big Sky State, I think, or something like that. You know what it's called that? Because there's not many obstructions in certain parts of Montana. And at night, or even during the day, the sky just looks huge. So I remember looking at the stars when we first moved to Alberta and just being amazed and, and being in awe. Because when I go look at my stars in my backyard here in Pennsylvania, there's trees all around my house. So I just have this view just above my head. But in Alberta, there wasn't many trees. It was kind of flat, which during the day made it kind of boring. But at night, I mean, that sky stretched from one side and just this huge expanse to the other side. And it was amazing. And I can't help but wonder if the starry host that we bow to is that desire to be seen, that desire to be noticed. That desire to be wanted, that desire to be loved, that's a good desire when it's connecting with God, but when we project it on other things, when we need to be liked by other people or we don't have any sense of value for ourselves, it becomes a starry host. Romans chapter 1, verse 25 says, They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. So when we look to the creation to meet a need that can only be met by the Creator, we're bowing to a counter for God. And finally, Zephaniah mentions Moloch. Moloch was an Ammonite god, Leviticus 18.21. God said, do not give any of your children to be sacrificed to Moloch, for you must not profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. I wish I, wish I didn't even have to bring this one up. It's so heinous. People would actually sacrifice their firstborn child. They'd bring their firstborn child before an idol of Moloch, a metal idol, put it on the idol, and burn their child to death as a sacrifice, believing that Moloch would ensure them prosperity for their family and for their future children. They would sacrifice their firstborn child, trying to appease this false counterfeit God. And when we read about this kind of sacrifice, our modern day uh, minds might immediately go to the, the practice of abortion in our day. And according to the World Health Organization, every year there's an estimated 40 to 50 million abortions performed around the world, over half a million in the United States alone. And listen, I want you to hear me. If you've had an abortion, if you know somebody that has had an abortion, I'm not sharing this to bring any kind of shame on you. God's love has, is not dependent on anything we do, anything that we don't do. It's based entirely on who he is. Jesus Christ died on a cross to offer forgiveness for every sin, not just certain ones. He removes all shame. I want to make that clear. So if that's you or you know somebody who's been through that, we are not trying to heap guilt on you. We're trying to see you free. 
Jesus Christ can set you free. And I also want to make clear that that is not the only way that we sacrifice our children to the counterfeit gods of our day. We could sacrifice our kids by making our careers our idol and allowing work to consume us to the point where it cuts into our time that we should be spending with our kids. We can sacrifice our kids with too many activities because we're convinced that if their activity schedule isn't completely full, that they won't be successful in life. That could become overload. I'm not talking about healthy training. I'm not talking about preparing our children for life. I'm talking about overload for fear of missing out. I'm talking about trying to compete or keep up with all the other kids or trying to make up for the things that we didn't accomplish when we were younger. When we do that, we, we sacrifice our kids. Because anything can become a counterfeit God. In fact, if you're looking for a good resource on this, Tim Keller has a book that he's written called Counterfeit Gods. I highly recommend it. He gives a lot more examples than we have time for today. But in that book, he, he writes... Uh, he writes, we think idols are bad things, but that's almost never the case. The greater the good, the more likely we are to expect that it can satisfy our deepest needs and hopes. Anything can serve as a counterfeit God, especially the very best things in life. So we've got to be on the lookout. We've got to look out. We can learn from these people. If we're on the lookout for these warning signs, counterfeit gods are one of the first warning signs that show up in our lives that, that show that we're, we're heading down the wrong path. And it's time to turn around. A second warning sign that we see in Zephaniah chapter 1 is these people ceased pursuing God. They stopped pursuing God. Verse 6 describes them as those who turn back from following the Lord, and they neither seek the Lord nor inquire of him. They stopped believing him. They didn't pursue him anymore. They stopped talking to him. They stopped asking him questions. A.W. Tozer, in his book, The Pursuit of God, he writes, the stiff and wooden quality about our religious lives is a result of our lack of holy desire. Acute desire must be present or there will be no manifestation of Christ to his people. He waits to be wanted. Too bad that with many of us, he waits so long, so very long, in vain. That's a warning sign. If you don't have that longing for God, if there, that there's, there's something's, going, something's going off, something, if we lose that desire to pursue him, if we allow ourselves to be disconnected, it's an indication that something's going on beneath the surface of our soul. I'm not talking about dry seasons or desert periods. Like, those are normal. Every one of us goes through periods of time where maybe we don't hear God's voice as clearly, but not for lack of pursuing God. We all go through dry times, seasons, you know, where it doesn't feel like we're growing very much. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about where we're no longer actively or intentionally pursuing God or talking to him. Or where we're neglecting our relationship with him. Or where we're turning back from following him. I mean, man, you read through the Psalms and the psalmist is always describing dry times that are normal. That's not what I'm talking about. When this happens, when we stop pursuing God, when we cease to pursue him, when we cease to want him, it leads to a third warning sign that we see in chapter 1, and that's complacency. Verse 2, God says, At that time I will search Jerusalem with lamps and punish those who are complacent, who are like wine left on its dregs, who think the Lord will do nothing, either good or bad. Now listen to the imagery there. This is vivid. He describes complacency, complacent people, as being like wine left on its dregs. Or your translation might say wine left on its lees. Dregs or lees, you know what that is? It's the solid matter that falls to the bottom of a bottle of jar or a jar of wine as the wine is fermenting. It's the dead yeast cells. It's the pieces of seeds and the pieces of dead skin from the grapes that settle to the bottom. Now, winemakers will leave it there for a little while to help flavor, but if it's left there too long, if you leave the wine too long on the dreads, you know what happens? It becomes harsh. It becomes bitter. And that's how God describes us when we become complacent. He says, you're like wine just being left to rot. Wine that's ready to go bad, that's ready to get ruined. You're, you're just, be, you've become bitter, you become harsh. We get stuck in this place where we're just kind of indifferent to God. Verse 12 describes this as people who think, well, God's not going to do nothing anyway, neither good nor bad. 
So there's this complacency. Tozer calls complacency a deadly foe of all spiritual growth. So all of these warning signs that we talk about, they're all deadly foes of spiritual growth. When we see counterfeit gods in our life, when we cease to actively pursue God, when we've become complacent, these are all red flags. These are warning lights on the dashboard of your soul saying something's wrong. Time to get a checkup. Time to get your soul into the mechanic. So what can we do when we see these warning signs? Well, in chapter 2, turn there. Zephaniah puts out this, we already talked about it a little bit, this call or this invitation for repentance. A call for repentance to turn the opposite way and start pursuing God. Verse 1, he says, gather together, gather yourselves together, you shameful nation, before the decree takes effect. And that day passes like wind-blown chaff before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you. Before the day of the Lord's wrath comes upon you. See, his heart is, guys, turn. This destruction is coming, but turn from it. Repent from it. Verse 3 says, Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, you who do what he commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you will be sheltered on the day of the Lord's anger. What does Zephaniah's name mean? He who shelters. God who hides, God who protects. And while we can't say this with absolute certainty that Judah responded positively to this call, there appears to be some major evidence that Zephaniah had a major impact on King Josiah. There's a good chance that the reforms that Josiah put into place were a direct response to Zephaniah's message here to repent. So I want to look at a few of those. If you have a few in your Bible, turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 34 for a minute. And 2 Kings 23 is another chapter that describes some of these reforms, some of these, what I'm calling possible responses. You could even say probable responses, because I think they're probable. But if you turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 34, we're going to look at four of them really quick. Responses in response to this call to repentance. First of all, we see that Josiah himself experienced a, a personal revival, if you will. King Josiah experienced a, a revival of his soul. He becomes king when he's eight years old. When he's eight years old, according to verse 1. And in verse 3, we read, In the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father David. So at age 16, so pay attention, young people. Josiah begins a personal relationship with God. He experiences this awakening. Not a going through the motions awakening. It says that he begins to pursue the God of his father David. I think that's intentional that they put that David's is one of his ancestors. Why? Because if you want to read about pursuing God, you want to read David. You want to read David's Psalms. You want to read about his... Because it's like Psalm 63. David says things like this. God, you are my God. He says, earnestly, I seek you. Not lightly. Not haphazardly. Not, he, doesn't, he says, I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a drying and parched land where there is no water. Notice, David doesn't accidentally drift towards God. He pursues him with his entire being. He gives everything he has to him. So there's this personal revival, I think, in response to Zephaniah's preaching, to Zephaniah's message. And then the second response, possible response that we see in 2 Chronicles 34 was it the, the, and again, could have been spurred on by Zephaniah's message. We see the removal of idols. Verse 3 continues, in his 12th year, so he's 20 at this point, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of high places, Asherah poles, and idols. Verse 4 says, under his direction, the altars of the Baals were torn down. He cut to pieces the incense altars that were above them and smashed the Asherah poles and the idols. So at age 20, he is making it his business to remove these counterfeit gods from the land, these things that are holding God's people back. And in the 18th year of his reign, at age 26, he begins a remodeling project on the temple. And in the process, there is this rediscovery of the book of the law, a rediscovery of God's word, God's covenant with his people. Verse 14 says, while they were bringing out the money that had been taken into the temple of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord that had been given through Moses. Is it any wonder now why they had started to drift, why they had started to go off? But they didn't even know where the law was. What's our excuse? Most of us have more Bibles in our homes than we know what to do with. Most of us have them on our devices, on our apps. 
They found this law and they read it. And when they read it, it does something. It brings King Josiah to tears. He tears his robe. And he says, those who have gone on before us, they haven't been keeping this word of the Lord. They haven't acted in accordance to what's written in this book. And this rediscovery of the book of the law, it leads to this transformation. It leads to this renewal of their covenant relationship with God. This one, we're going to go to 2 Kings 23 because it describes it. Same, same thing that's happening right now, but 2 Kings really brings it out. 23 verse 3 says, the king stood by the pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord to follow the Lord and keep his commands, statutes, and decrees with all his heart and all his soul, thus confirming the words of the covenant written in this book. And then listen to this, all the people, not just the king, all the people pledged themselves to this covenant. This is what they said they wanted. This is what they said they wanted to go after. This is what they wanted to be committed to, this covenant relationship with God where they'd follow him with all their heart and with all their soul. And for a time, you know, everything looked good on the surface. But like I said earlier, it must have been short-lived because remember Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 7, God said of Jerusalem, he said, I thought, surely you'll fear me. Surely you'll accept correction. And if you did this, your place of refuge would not be destroyed or my punishments wouldn't come out upon her. But God says, but they were still eager to act corruptly in all they did. And, and 12 years after King Josiah died, the Babylonians captured Jerusalem. They began carrying the first exiles into captivity. So what happened? What's the heart of the matter? Well, I believe we get some major insights into the message of the minor prophet Zephaniah from the major prophet Jeremiah. Listen to Jeremiah chapter 3, verses 6 through 10. We read, during the reign of King Josiah, so this is the same time that Zephaniah is prophesying, during the reign of King Josiah, the Lord said to me, Jeremiah, have you seen what faithless Israel has done? She's gone up on every high hill and under every spreading tree and has committed adultery there. I thought that after she had done all this, she would return to me, but she did not. So what did God do? We read about this. Sent the Assyrians in. The Assyrians wiped out the northern kingdom, carried them off into captivity. But we continue, and her unfaithful sister Judah saw it. They saw it. They should have learned from their example. But look what he says. I gave faithless Israel her certificate of divorce and sent her away because of all of her adulteries. Yet I saw that her unfaithful sister Judah had no fear. She also went out and committed adultery because Israel's immorality mattered so little to her. She defiled the land, committed adultery with stone and wood. And then in verse 10, in spite of all this, her unfaithful sister Judah did not return to me with all her heart, but only in pretense, declares the Lord. Did you catch that? Judah did all the right stuff on the surface, on the outside. It looked like she was returning to God, like she was doing all the things that Zephaniah warned against. You know, he said, you're going against counterfeit gods. You're ceasing to, to follow God. They, 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 they removed the idols. They made it look like they were following God. They weren't complacent anymore, going against all those things. That's what it looked like on the surface, but something was missing. And God makes it really clear. She did not return to me with all her heart, but only in pretense. It was all just a show. They were going through the motions, the removal of the idols, the rediscovery of God's word, the renewal of the covenant. It was missing one major thing. The major message of Zephaniah, which we needed a little help with from Jeremiah to get to, is the heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. The heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. Listen, guys, you can go to church. You can sing songs. You can read your Bible. You can get in a D3 group and go every week that it takes place. You can serve God using your gifts. But if your heart is not in it, if your whole heart is not in it, it's just pretense. It's just show. It's just religious activity. It's not revival. It's not awakening. You want to get to the heart of the matter? The heart 
is the matter. Let me say that again. The heart is the matter. Instead of returning to God with all their heart, they settled for a shallow religion and for appearances. Guys, there's so much more. Don't settle for that. God puts it like this in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. He says, my people have committed two sins. Man, he really simplifies it for us. He boils it all down. He says, they've done two things wrong. This is where they missed it. This is where they got it wrong. He said, they've forsaken me, God, the spring of living water. And they've dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Did you catch that? They could have had a spring of living water and they settled for a pit. You know what a cistern was? It was a hole in the ground that collected dirty rainwater. The water that ran over everything else and ended up in that cistern. That's what they settled for. They settled for a pit. They could have had a spring and they settled for a pit. They could have had pure life-giving water, but they settled for dirty rain runoff that filled cisterns, which by the way, those cisterns were broken. They couldn't stay filled. God's a spring. He never runs out. So they settled for something dirty and broken that was going to run out instead of this life-giving spring of living water. It was a matter of the heart. Their hearts belonged to counterfeit gods and they continued to come up empty. That's the bad news. The good news is that when Zephaniah describes the future hope for the faithful and he's leaning toward the coming of Christ and then the, the second coming of Christ and when the, this hope for this faithful remnant in chapter 3, he's giving us the picture of what a healthy heart could look like. He's giving us a picture of the kind of relationship that God desires to have with each one of us. And this is the verse I've been waiting to get to. This is one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture. Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 17 says this. The Lord your God is with you. The mighty warrior who saves, he will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. I want to just spend our last few minutes on this one verse. I just want to break it down. I want to get a picture of the kind of relationship that's possible, of what a healthy heart that's pursuing God can look like. We see that in the first part of this picture that God desires a relationship with each one of us where we have this continual experience of God's presence. Notice the Lord, your God is with you. Now, we may know in our head that God is with us all the time. God's omnipresent. He's everywhere present all the time. But that has little impact on our life unless God is manifest in our life, unless we recognize his presence, unless our awareness of his presence in our lives is raised, unless we, unless we experience it. Tozer wrote this about the manifest presence of God. He wrote, God is manifest only when and as we are aware of his presence. So God's always presence. He says, on our part, there must be surrender to the Spirit of God. For his work is to show us the Father and the Son. If we cooperate with him in loving obedience, God will manifest himself to us. And that manifestation will be the difference between a nominal Christian life and a life radiant with the light of his face. I think that's the difference between a life-giving spring and a broken cistern. The manifest presence of God. And Tozer says we've got to surrender to the Holy Spirit because it's the Holy Spirit's job to make the love of God known to us, to make the love of the Father, to reveal Jesus Christ and his glory. That's what the Holy Spirit does in our life. When we put our faith and trust in God, we, the Holy Spirit takes up divine residence in our lives. And so as we surrender to him, as we encounter this manifest presence of God, it's something God wants us to be aware of. And it changes everything. God also wants us to experience his power. Notice the Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. So stop trying to save ourselves. God is the mighty warrior that saves. Listen, salvation, this idea of being saved, it's not just a prayer that we pray to get into heaven when we die, which, by the way, that prayer is nowhere found in Scripture. Salvation is being saved from everything that kept us separated from and tries to keep us separated from a deep, life-giving relationship with God. God accomplished that through Jesus Christ. 
our sin, our rebellion, our moving away, that keeps us separated from God. It, it hinders our relationship. So God sent Jesus to live a perfect life, to take the punishment that we deserve, to suffer and die on a cross, so that we wouldn't have to take that punishment, so we can be brought back into relationship with God. And that's not just so that we can go to heaven someday when we die. I mean, we will. That's the great ultimate reality. We will spend eternity with God. That's amazing. But in the meantime, God wants to save us from those counterfeit gods that distract us, he wants to save us from all that caused us to cease following him. It sidetracks us. He wants us to save us from our complacency and save us from our whatever else is, is hindering us from experiencing the life. He wants us to experience the power that helps us live up to our true identity in Christ. And then finally, God wants us to experience the great pleasure that God takes in us. This one took me a long time in my life to just start to grasp. But I'm so glad, I, I, and I'm not sure I'm even there yet, but I'm so glad I've started this process of understanding that God takes delight in us. That God takes great pleasure in us. That we are his sons, we are his daughters. He will take great delight in you, verse 17, in his love. He will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. Guys, if, if you don't hear anything else this morning, that we've talked about. Hear this. The relationship that God wants you to have with him, the one that Jesus went to the cross for, is a relationship of delight, not duty. It's a relationship of delight, not duty. It's not we have to, it's we get to. We get to. Because of Jesus, we get to discover this life-changing relationship with God. We don't have to. God gives you a free will. You want to choose the dirty cistern? He'll let you choose it. You want to choose death? He'll let you choose that over life. But, but, but we get to choose this life-changing relationship with God where the Holy Spirit actually comes, takes residence up with us, testifies. Like read Romans chapter 8. Testifies with our spirit that we're God's children, that God's love's been poured out to us through his Holy Spirit. We get to experience his manifest presence in our lives. We get to experience the life-changing power of the Holy Spirit as we surrender to him. We don't have to stay stuck in our sin or our shame or our past. We can be transformed more and more into this new identity in Christ. And we get to, we don't have to, we get to experience the great delight that God takes in us. Not duty, delight. Now he's delighting over you whether you choose to acknowledge it and enjoy it or not. I want to encourage you to enjoy it. Take delight in it. Not duty, delight. The creator and sustainer of the universe of everything takes great delight in you. He rejoices over you with singing. Some translations even, or, or some commentaries that I read in that actually said some of the nuances there could even indicate that God is not just singing over you, that he's dancing over you. But that's how much he loves you. That's how much he rejoices over you. Guys, the heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. For so long in my walk with God, I missed this. For so long, my walk with God was about duty. It was about trying to prove to God that I was worthy somehow of being his son. It was about earning. It was about going through all the different motions and the religious activity. And God just ripped that out of my heart and said, no, it's not about duty. It's about delight. That God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. God is looking for men and women after his own heart. The heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. He's looking for people who will love him with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind, with all their strength, which by the way, Jesus said was the first and greatest commandment. So I want to close this morning with one more Tozer quote. I know I've already used two, but I've been reading the pursuit of God again, and I can't help myself. There's too much good stuff to share. So I want to invite you to stand with me as I share this quote, because sometimes when we stand, we pay better attention, and I want you to hear this. I think our tendency when we try to get to the heart of the matter is we tend to overcomplicate things. So listen to Tozer's words. He writes this, every age has its own characteristics. Right now, we are in an age of religious complexity. Now, the amazing thing about this is he wrote this 70 years ago. 
Has anybody's life gotten simpler or more complex? So hear this, guys. Right now, we are in an age, because this is prophetic, we are in an age of religious complexity. The simplicity which is in Christ is rarely found among us. In its stead are programs, methods, organizations, and a world of nervous activities which occupy time and attention but could never satisfy the longing of a heart. Hear that, church. This world of nervous activities, the things that occupy our time and our attention that become counterfeit gods, they, they, can, they can occupy our time and our attention, but they can't satisfy the longing of our heart. He goes on to say this. We must simplify our approach to him. We must strip down to the essentials, and they will be found to be blessedly few. We must put away all efforts to impress and come with the guileless candor of childhood. If we do this, without doubt, God will quickly respond. So let's pray.